Chapter 4. Municipal Democracy, Colonial and Revolutionary The New England Town Meeting The Puritans, who settled colonial New England, were neither willing nor conscious bearers of the tradition of direct democracy. The original generation who founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony, 1629, thought democracy was quite frankly immoral. John Winthrop, the colony's first governor, and his fellow congregants, much preferred rule by the elect, by the visible saints, as they were called, who had supposedly enjoyed an epiphany of divine grace. Scripture seemed to them to dictate that the elect should rule through aristocracy or monarchy. Nevertheless, the New England Puritans practiced a religion called Congregationalism that was remarkably democratic, a form of English Protestantism that championed the autonomy of the individual congregation against all priests and bishops. Congregationalism was based on the idea that each congregation of worshippers was an autonomous compact unto itself, subordinate to no mortal person, that was to be guided only by scripture. Thus, Congregationalist Puritanism rejected all liturgical and ecclesiastical aspects of the Christian religion. That is, it rejected not only the Roman Church but the Anglican, which shared many of the hierarchical features of Catholicism. Congregationalists relied instead on scripture, on their own private relationship with the divine, and on one another, unmediated by clergy, for the salvation of their souls. Binding themselves into covenanted communities in the new world, they promised to obey God and look out for one another's souls in a spirit of mutual fellowship. As they settled the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1630s, the Congregational Puritans formed fairly autonomous towns, structured around their own self-gathered churches. Each congregation governed itself by a covenant that its members wrote together as a community. An embryonic democratic ideal thus informed the ethos of each congregation, that the entire congregation participated in group decisions implied democratic rule. And just as each congregation had made its own religious covenant, so too did each town make a town covenant by which it handled its own temporal affairs. Their town planning practices reflected this orientation toward democratic community. The original group who founded the town would collectively receive from the colony itself a deed to the land, which they divided among themselves. Each male inhabitant was given a one to ten acre plot of land as a freehold on which he could support himself and his family. Land ownership was thus kept roughly egalitarian, and extremes of wealth and poverty were avoided for a considerable period of time. The town militias, to which all able-bodied men, members of the community belonged, were products of the same egalitarian spirit, as they mustered in drills on the town green. As for town government, the New Englanders established town meetings, general assemblies, that met on regular basis to conduct the town's affairs. The town meeting was essentially the religious congregation, with its insistence on a self-generated, autonomous covenant, reconstituted for dealing with civil affairs. Although the town meeting lacked any underpinning in democratic theory, it was astonishingly democratic in practice. In theory, only adult male church members, those who had received grace and become visible saints, were eligible to vote in town meetings. Non-church members could attend meetings and participate in the deliberations, but they were not permitted to share in actual decision-making. But the towns quickly found that it was simply not feasible to allow only a minority to occupy the political realm, and the religious qualification for voting became a dead letter. The franchise was widened to include all adult male inhabitants who had some property or regular income, £20 sterling, a relatively small sum, then finally, any man could simply swear an oath to the effect that he had possessed the right amount of property. The New England political realm was thus increasingly open to men who would have been excluded in almost every English borough and town, that is, to most male heads of household. Moreover, anyone who could vote was also eligible to hold office. Contrary to the oligarchical prerogatives of England, office holding in Massachusetts Bay was broadly elective rather than narrowly appointive. The first town meeting held in Cambridge in 1632 
was a monthly meeting called in order to make decisions about local problems. Soon other towns were holding similar meetings, and they were doing so as often as they deemed necessary. In 1635, the general courts, the government of the whole colony, statutorily recognised the town meeting as the supreme governing body in each town. At first, the townspeople themselves were fairly passive about exercising the broad sovereign powers granted them, both by the 1635 statute and by their existing situation. Their town meetings assembled infrequently, only a few times a year, and transacted only routine business when they did. Townspeople preferred to delegate their power to the select men, the handful of officials who made up the select board, the administrative arm of the town meeting. Nothing in the colony's legal code gave the select men greater or more powers than the town meeting itself. They were only supposed to carry out the decisions of the town meeting in between sessions. But in the first generation of settlement, the select men were religious elders or their secular equivalents, actually constituting a de facto aristocracy of visible saints. As a small group of seven to nine members, the select board could meet more frequently and more informally than the larger and hence more cumbersome town meetings, and they could make decisions more expeditiously, without having to consult many different individual points of view. The townspeople could have voted the selectmen out of office easily. Their terms of office lasted only one year, but in the early years, the people were still deferential to the venerable men who had guided them to the new land and formed their religious covenant. Holding the select men in awe, they re-elected them indefinitely year after year and allowed them to exercise the primary governing power, while the town meeting themselves acted as mere rubber stamps, out of reverence for their higher wisdom and experience. Between 1680 and 1720, however, the town meetings gained the upper hand over the select boards, transforming town polities from de facto oligarchies into de facto democracies. After the original generation of select men died off, the second generation did not command the level of veneration that their predecessors had enjoyed. Merely by virtue of their relative youth, the new select men were less experienced and less awe-inspiring. Thenceforth, the townspeople gradually took the policy-making initiative back from the select boards, Instead of meeting only a few times a year to ratify the selectmen's decisions, the town meetings met more frequently, as often as they themselves felt was necessary, and they freely exercised their veto over the selectmen's proposals instead of accepting them docilely. They now claimed in practice the power that they already possessed legally. Ultimately, the town meetings came completely into their own as decision-making bodies. They imposed taxes, spent money, authorised land divisions, settled title and land use disputes, approved immigrants, granted economic concessions, and gave permission for creating various economic enterprises functioning as the town's economic planning boards. With the exercise of these expanding powers, debate and contention grew, and a new spirit of action and pride pervaded the meetings. As for the colony-wide government of Massachusetts Bay, each town sent delegates to the assembly in Boston. Early in the colony's history, the delegates, like the selectmen, had been elders and their actions in the capital had been above public scrutiny. But in later generations, the town meetings took an acute interest in making certain that their delegates voted in Boston the way the public at home had instructed them. An elected committee in the town would draw up a set of instructions to the delegate, then debate and vote on them in the town meeting whereupon the meeting would bind the delegate to vote accordingly. Under the injunction of such mandates, a deputy became a mere agent of citizens in their towns. As a result of popular pressure after around 1700, the delegates to the Boston Assembly were required to bring an account of each session back to their respective town meetings. In fact, at least one town even sent a guardian along with the delegate to make sure he behaved in accordance with the public's mandate and journals of the assembly were printed up precisely to publicise how delegates had voted. Finally, the election of deputies was annual, another powerful constraint on their power, as John Adams would declare in 1776, where annual elections end, slavery begins. By virtue of the town's strong control over the assembly, the Boston Assembly was less a legislative body than a confederal council or congress. For much of the 18th century, the Massachusetts towns enjoyed an extraordinary degree of freedom, a degree of sovereignty remarkable for their era or any other. 
by any standard. Although the Confederal Congress in Boston passed laws that affected the towns, most towns obeyed them mainly at their own discretion. In fact, disobedience was flagrant. In 18th century Massachusetts, the towns were supreme, not only on paper but in practice. The experience with local power gave the townspeople an entirely new orientation toward authority, long before the Declaration of Independence. The Massachusetts towns were operating on the principle that the only legitimate government derives from the consent of the governed. Indeed, that the only legitimate government was self-government. It was the direct democracy of the Massachusetts towns, with what became their radical political views, that the British Crown found most intolerable. And after the Boston Tea Party, one of London's first acts was to pass a law shutting down the town meetings. It was an, quote, intolerable act, unquote, that, given the self-sovereignty of the towns, could not suppress their political practices, and their open defiance became a flashpoint for the revolt of all the American colonies against British rule. In one of the ironies of history, the town meetings did not survive intact the revolution they did so much degenerate. Their power was eviscerated first by the state constitutions drawn up during the war, and subsequently by the federal constitution. Although town meetings exist today, mainly in New England, the days when they were sovereign have long since passed into history. The Parisian Sections In France, the Parisian sectional assemblies of 1793 were the most democratic and radical political institutions to emerge during the course of the Great Revolution. In preparation for the epochal meeting of the Estates General in Versailles in 1789, the French monarchy was obliged to establish electoral districts throughout France, where commoners could gather in assemblies to choose their deputies for the third estate, or rather, to choose an intermediate set of electors who in turn would choose the deputies. So disinclined was the monarchy to allow even propertied commoners to vote directly. Sixty district assemblies were constituted in Paris, where they duly carried out their task, but once they chose their deputies, the Parisian assemblies persisted in meeting, even though they had lost their legal reason for existence. Thus, even as the estate general, soon renamed the National Assembly, was meeting in Versailles, the Parisian district assemblies kept meeting regularly as quasi-legal bodies, acting out as guardians of their limited freedoms in the fast-moving political situation. After December 1789, such assemblies became the legal basis for municipal government in all the large French cities. The National Assembly, and later the Constituent Assembly that followed it, reconfigured Paris's 60 districts into 48 sections. All the other large French cities, Lyon and Marseille, Bordeaux and Toulouse, were divided into sections as well, with assemblies to look after community affairs. Collectively, the various sectional assemblies in the city exercised control over that city's central municipal authority, or commune. As the revolution unfolded, about 44,000 autonomous local communes, the large ones controlled by sectional assemblies, occupied much of the political realm in France, concerning themselves not only with local but with national issues. They acquired the power to call out their own branches of the National Guard, and in both structure and political content, they became increasingly democratic and radical. In Paris, the sectional assemblies even opened their doors to all adult males, and in some cases to women, regardless of property or status qualifications. Indeed, the Parisian sections themselves formed the basis for an extremely radical, direct, civic democracy. This sectional movement, which matured in Paris in 1792 and 1793, was a self-conscious, direct democratic phenomenon, Regardless of whether its members were politically radical, each popular assembly formed the fundamental, deliberative and decision-making body of its section. Ideologically, the sectionnaires regarded popular sovereignty as an inalienable right to be enjoyed by all citizens, one that could not be preempted by representatives to national assemblies. Meeting in expropriated chapels and churches, each sectional assembly elected six deputies to the Paris Commune one of whose major functions was to coordinate all the sections in the city. 
Each section was also possessed of a variety of committees that performed such functions as police, supply, finance and neighbourhood surveillance. Of paramount importance, each section also had its own battalion of the National Guard, including an artillery unit, over which it exercised complete control and whose movements it alone could authorise. The sectionaires interested themselves passionately in these military units. Assembly meetings in which National Guard officers were elected drew the greatest attendance, greater even than those in which civilian officials were elected. In 1793, during the height of the Parisian radical democracy, sectional life was vibrant, disputatious and earthy. Periods of crisis might attract a thousand citizens or more to an assembly meeting, often crowding the hall to the bursting point. While debates were often vigorous, the various factions contending with one another heatedly. Some sectional assemblies were genuine political battlegrounds. Within a particular section, citizens' interests might vary widely according to economic status, ideology and social background. During even the most militant periods of the revolution, royalists and moderates still turned out for meetings, as well as extreme radicals. Furious confrontations often exploded into threats, shouts and mutual recrimination, not to speak of fistfights. The radical sectionaires who occupied this political realm were the same people who invaded the Tuileries in August 1792 and deposed the king, leading to his execution, and who teetered on the brink of a radical insurrection against the convention in June 1793. Had it been successful, this insurrection might have given full power to a national confederation of sectional assemblies. It was during this last period of ferment that the radical democrat Jean Vallée, whose political home was the section called Droit de l'Homme, tried to organise delegates from each section into a counterpower that would constitute a, quote, commune of communes, unquote, a confederation of cities and towns, communes, all over France to supplant the National Convention. In effect, the radical sectionaires stood at the forefront of the revolutionary movement in France. It was no doubt for this reason that their leaders were among the first to be arrested by the Jacobin regime when it came to power in June 1793. Derived from the district assemblies, the sectional assemblies had elbowed their way into existence in flat defiance of the nation-state that created them. They went on to provide the institutional structure for an extraordinary direct democracy, and as such, they constituted yet another important moment in that abiding tradition. For libertarian municipalism, they have a particular importance, since they were not only situated in the largest city on the European continent, but played a driving role in radicalising one of the greatest revolutions in history.